Gladstone's decline and death had little effect on the Queen. Years ago, she had unashamedly fallen for his political opponent, Benjamin Disraeli, whose One Nation Toryism was her kind of politics. Besides, he knew how to make her laugh. At Disraeli's private home in the heart of Buckinghamshire, curator Robert Bandy is the proud keeper of the numerous gifts Victoria lavished on Disraeli. This is the dining room. We have an awful lot of portraits in the house for gifts from the Queen. All of them have a crown on the top to tell us exactly who they came from. In case you could be in any doubt. <laughs> in, ca in case you could be in any doubt, exactly. An unconventional visit to Hewenden in 1877 showed Disraeli's political skill and charm. When Disraeli collected the Queen from Wickham Station, he took two carriages with him, one with slightly faster horses, so he could welcome the Queen for the first time on the platform. Obviously, great statesman, showman, lots of bowing and dipping. Very theatrical. Very, very theatrical. People in Wickham loved it. He popped into the first carriage with the quicker horses, got back to Hewenden before the Queen so he could welcome her in exactly the same way, but for a second time, once she got to the front door of the manor. That's delicious. And um, he obviously was mindful she was a slightly short lady and had the bottom two inches of her dining chair ah. sawn off <laughs> so that her feet were flat on the floor when she sat. If she'd sat on a normal chair, of course, her feet would have been dangling in the air. And he didn't think that was particularly becoming of um, Mark. That's very funny. This is another present from her. So it's the collected speeches of, of Albert. This is very remarkable because at first she was a little bit... She disliked him entirely. Um, when he was just a member of the house. But he grew useful to her, because whereas she complained that Gladstone referred to her as though she were a public meeting, um, Disraeli gave her the opposite end of the spectrum. He gave her the tittle-tattle and the gossip, and he would write three or four notes a day to her from Parliament. And, of course, she had a very marked sense of humour, and uh, she liked the fact that he made accounts of Parliament and cabinets. Yes. That was so amusing. She laughed over his letters. Now, who have we here on the chimney piece? We've got... Um, John Brown, given by the Queen to Disraeli. Two relative outsiders. Disraeli, most unlikely Victorian Prime Minister. And Brown, completely out of the normal social sphere for the Queen, was drawn in closest to her. Very much so. Both Brown and Disraeli gave Victoria the loyalty she always longed for, and she lapped up Dizzy's endless attention and flattery. He is so full of poetry romance and chivalry. When he knelt down to kiss my hand, which he took in both of his, he said, in loving loyalty and faith. Disraeli not only amused and flirted with Victoria, he understood her emotional struggles in life. Professor Jane Ridley has written biographies of both Disraeli and Queen Victoria. Disraeli didn't treat her as a stupid woman. Uh, Disraeli treated her as a sort of exotic and wonderful queen. He also treated her as an equal. He made her feel, by writing her these wonderful um, sort of confidential letters, uh, that he was telling her everything and that he was her minister and together they were ruling the country. Um, so he made her feel, feel good. She wasn't, you know, before she'd had this awful generation of um, those dreadful old men, she called them, who talked down to her and, and didn't sort of... Um, uh, flatter her in this way. But Disraeli is on his knees flattering her right from day one, and she loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> People smiled at Victoria's crush on Disraeli and at his shameless camp manipulation of it. He dubbed her the fairy or the fairy queen. He was genuinely fond of her, but he was prepared to exploit the friendship for political ends. Britain was moving to a position where eventually every male adult would have the vote, and many politicians feared this would mean an inevitable lurch to the left. Disraeli had his finger on the pulse. He knew there were thousands and thousands of lower middle class and working class men who were natural Tories. Victoria became the perfect figurehead for Disraeli's one nation conservatism. His plans involved Victoria as a symbol of British power, not just at home, but stretching far across the world to the empire. Showing both political astuteness and glorious creativity, Disraeli announced Victoria was the Empress of India on January the 1st, 1877. 
She was delighted with the new title. My thoughts much taken up with the great event at Delhi today and in India generally, where I am being proclaimed Empress of India. I have for the first time today signed myself as V, R and I. Empress of India. It's a title you might think more appropriate for a railway engine or possibly even a pig. But it made Britain an imperial power. India, in all its exotic expense, now came under the royal dominion of the fairy. Of course, sophisticated people flinched at the title. But Victoria and Israeli knew that the vast proportion of the British people thought the empire made Britain rich. And for the next 80 years, the empire was the pride of Britain's conservatives and the envy of many beyond its borders. As she'd instinctively used her diplomatic skills in Germany in the years following Albert's death, Victoria leaped at the chance to stand at the helm of Disraeli's political ideals to galvanize Britain's classes under a powerful monarch. There's a glorious romance about being Victoria R. I, rather than simply Victoria Regina. It was a real publicity coup in India. Victoria is extraordinarily popular. They see her as almost a goddess figure, even though she never went there in her life. You know, she has this extraordinary common sense about sort of predicting uh, what's going to happen and about politics. And in, about the Empress of India thing, she was absolutely right. It was a really astute political... It was, wasn't it? Yes. Mm. But the pair's political romance couldn't last forever. Disraeli fought on in politics to his dying day. Victoria showered attention on him right to the end bestowing on him a peerage as Lord Beaconsfield. At his death, she was distraught. I cannot write in the third person at this terrible moment, when I can scarcely see for my fast falling tears. Victoria made the most extraordinary confession to her friend, Lady Waterpark. I know you will feel for me in my great and irreplaceable loss. I have lost so many but none whose loss will be more heavily felt than this of dear Lord Beaconsfield. They are remarkable words when you consider how recently she'd lost her beloved daughter Alice and how intensely she'd mourned the Prince Consort. They show how close Victoria had become, both in politics and in her heart, to Dizzy. Gladstone was the dictatorial prime minister. Disraeli was the true and trusted friend. 